There are many different types of computer errors, but there's three main types that can establish a framework for understanding any type of error. Those are logical compile time and runtime. Logical errors are what happen when a piece of software produces a result that's unexpected or undesirable. This is often referred to as a bug. In the software development lifecycle, most of the focus is uh, revolves around reducing these bugs or solving these bugs. The patching process is used to solve software bugs. A compile time error occurs when the software is compiled. Okay? Compiling is the process of converting the software's code into something that's usable by the operating system. So a compile time error, much like it sounds, occurs when the program is compiling. This can often happen if there's a missing file or an incorrect file pointer. File pointer is missing uh, certain information. It points to an area that has no information. This is also known as a syntax error. So a compile time error is a syntax error. A runtime error occurs while the program is executing. Okay, this includes any crashes. So if your computer crashes or if you Windows crashes, you get the blue screen. Uh, those are runtime errors. Memory leaks are also runtime errors. They're also known as logic errors. Or logic errors are a type of runtime error. It's more accurate to say. So when you encounter an error or when your system encounters an error, you want that error to perform in a certain manner. Okay, you don't want the error to just completely destroy your data. You want your data and you want the application or the operating system to behave in a certain manner. And that's what's known as error handling. Steps that are taken when an error occurs. So software and hardware should fail in what's known as a secure state. And that means when an error occurs, the error doesn't reveal excessive information. The error message should just say an error has occurred and then log the error. The, the program or the operating system will log the error so they can be reviewed later. But on the error screen, the amount of information should be very limited. This will prevent attackers from causing errors and then reading information such as the version of the operating system or the version of the software being used uh, to further uh, conduct reconnaissance and understand the nature of what they're attacking. Errors should not create additional vulnerabilities. If one software fails, it should not create vulnerabilities for the entire operating system. It should not create a different uh, additional attack vectors for attackers to exploit. And it should also not affect if, if one piece of software fails, it should not affect other software on the device. Sometimes interactions with different components, while isolated, those components may operate just fine, but when combined, components could create errors for one another. This uh, is why you need a good change management process with testing in a testing environment that, in a staging environment that simulates the actual production environment to, in, to determine where these interactions might occur and where errors can occur. Inputs, particularly user inputs, are anything that is typed in or uh, put into a program. So in a web application like Gmail, user input would be the message of, to compose the uh, email. Or if there's a form on a website that requires you to sign up, you could input your name, first name, last name, address, phone number, etc. Those are all user inputs, okay? Inputs sometimes can be accepted by the web application or any application as code in what's known as an injection attack. So the user or the attacker is inputting code instead of what's desired. Like instead of first name, they would put a string of code. And the application would accept that code as actual code instead of uh, validating that input when with input validation. It would accept that code and then execute the code which benefits the attacker. So in order to prevent code from being executed or preventing users from being able to inject code, 
you need to incorporate what's known as input validation within your programs. An injection attack, as we said, is when an attacker injects code. There's many different types of injection attacks. When it comes to databases, like uh, SQL, or Structured Query Language Database, you can have SQL uh, statements that are injected to that database that can be read as code. No SQL is another type of database. Um, operating systems can be subjected to certain injection attacks, and some directories like that use lightweight directory access protocol or LDAP can be subject to injection attacks. There's others as well. These are some popular choices. SQL, which we'll talk about, is one of the more traditional injection attack vectors. So because if your application or your database is not validating code, it's not looking at the code and saying, okay, this is acceptable, or looking at the input and saying, this is an acceptable input. This is a first name. This is like John, okay? Or this string that we see here, uh, this first name says, select from accounts where customer ID requests parameter ID is anything. I don't know if that's a first name. That's what input validation essentially does. It lets you, it gives the web application or the database a framework to accept or reject certain inputs. So in this type, of, in this example here, we have this uh, string query, which is uh, a SQL query, and if inputted into a field, you're basically asking the the database to retrieve all accounts okay because you're saying I want to select all accounts where the customer ID is equal to this apostrophe and that apostrophe means with SQL any value so you're I'll, you're basically trying to ex, uh, request unrestricted access and if there's no input validation the SQL database could present all of the customer accounts and then the attacker would be able to gather that information just through a web interface. So to prevent this, prevent injection attacks, you need to use certain security mechanisms. Whitelists and blacklists are very helpful and just like any whitelist or blacklist, uh, blacklists require you to explicitly state what is not allowed and whitelists will let you state what is allowed. Whitelists are much more secure because you don't have to think of every possible code variety. So for a first name, you would only, you would say, for the first name field, I only want to accept just uh, letters, okay? Uppercase and lowercase letters, and that's it. No numbers, no parentheses, no apostrophes, no equal sign, nothing of that nature, just letters. And then maybe for a phone number, you just accept numbers. And in this manner, you're denying the ability for the attacker to come up with code statements because they can only use certain characters at a time. When it comes to a SQL database, uh, Structured Query Language or SQL database, just pronounced normally as SQL, these databases can implement stored procedures. Stored procedures are a series of SQL statements. Okay, SQL is a, a language just like anything else that relies on certain statements and commands to retrieve data, okay? So attackers, when conducting a SQL injection attack, will string those commands together and just write a, uh, a SQL command as code for the input. So instead of accepting code, okay, you can use stored procedures, which process there are a sequence of SQL statements that work together like a macro, okay, or like a mini program. So stored procedures, audit, they will perform data validation, and then they'll handle the inputs differently than regular SQL inputs. Okay, and because they use different techniques rather than a regular SQL input, they deny the attacker the use of uh, these injection attacks. They don't accept those inputs, like a, the input we had here or a string query, uh, they won't accept those the same as a regular uh, SQL database. Well, as a as database that doesn't use stored procedures or a SQL database not using stored procedures. 
So stored procedures are an excellent security technique for SQL databases. You can also use what the limit command to prevent data disclosure. You limit what it can be shown when a query is submitted to the database. Server-side and client-side validation are methods of input validation. They can either be done at the client side or at the server side, okay? The server is where the database is stored. The client is the application that accesses the database. So if you have a web application, the client that accesses the web application to submit a SQL query. So for example, Amazon or, uh, yeah, let's use Amazon or any online store, walmart.com. You have a search bar, like say on walmart.com, where you can type in the product that you want to find. When you type in that product, those inputs are sent to a database, okay? That input, that uh, customer input can be validated as the user inputs it, that would be client side, or when it's sent to the database on the server, server side. Client side validation is very quick, okay, but it's vulnerable because it can be bypassed and attacks on that interface can possibly compromise the database. Server-side validation uh, takes a little longer, but it's much more secure because you're ensuring that it's not, you're not, even if the application or this client-side uh, validation is bypassed, the server-side validation will validate all inputs to the server. The best security approach is to combine the two and perform both client and server-side validation. But just know for the exam that server-side validation is more secure. Uh -huh.